Hello, hello, hello. Hope everyone's having a wonderful day. And um, needless to say, we are going to be, you see what's behind me, J. Edgar Hoover and the history of the FBI. This should be an interesting one. This is going to be an interesting one, and this is brought to you by the People's Profiles. So, yeah, we are going to get into this because you guys have a right to hear about this because it is going. So, we'll find out who J. Edgar Hoover is. We'll do all of that. Uh, when I, when you guys get back from the intro, I won't be here. So let's get this started. Like we start everything else. People are always asking me, why am I so angry? The reason is because the country that I love. destroying itself from within. That's why I am. The angry conservative. man known to history as John Edgar Hoover was born on the morning of New Year's Day 1895 into a family of civil servants in the Capitol Hill District of Washington, D.C., the federal capital of the United States of America. His father, Dickerson Naylor Hoover, worked for the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey, a scientific agency responsible for mapping the U.S. coastline. The Hoovers arrived in Pennsylvania from Germany in the 18th century, before moving to Washington in the early 19th century. The family had been working for the federal government since the 1850s, beginning with John Edgar's grandfather, John Thomas Hoover, who joined the Coast Survey in 1853. His mother, Annie Scheitlin, was descended from the Hitz family, the most prominent of Washington's Swiss immigrants. Annie married Dickerson Hoover in around 1880 and the couple would have four children between 1880 and 1895, of whom John Edgar was the youngest. Less than two years before his birth, his sister Sadie Marguerite died of diphtheria at three years old. When John Edgar was born in 1895, the United States was just over a century old. 
the country had expanded westwards across the American continent to the Pacific Ocean, while its initial 13 states had now grown to 44. For much political power rested with the states, and the federal government remained weak. Though Abraham Lincoln used federal powers to keep the Union together during the American Civil War, after 11 southern states rebelled in 1861, over the possibility that the federal government might abolish slavery. After the abolition of slavery during the war, the rebellious southern states were reincorporated into the Union, while the federal government attempted to enforce voting rights for the black population. The final decades of the 19th century saw an economic boom known as the Gilded Age. During J.P. Morgan, the oil magnate John D. Rockefeller, industrialist Andrew Carnegie, and railway tycoon Cornelius Vanderbilt all made their vast fortunes. In June 1895, Dickerson Hoover became head of the Coast Survey's printing office in Washington. John Edgar enjoyed a closer bond with his mother Annie, who had high ambitions for all her children. He started school at the age of six at nearby Brent Elementary, where he proved to be a hard-working and intelligent pupil, who was well-liked by his teachers. In October, October 1905, while John Edgar was 10 years old, his aunt, Mary Scheitlin, was killed by her lover. Although he never mentioned the incident later in life, the tragedy had a great impact on his childhood. He soon began putting together his own childhood newspaper called Weekly Review, which frequently covered violent crimes and murders in the neighborhood. Growing up in Washington, the federal government ran through John Edgar's veins with the U.S. Capitol building just up the road from the Hoover home at Seawood Square. If, like J. Edgar Hoover, you want to start something of your own, say, a YouTube channel, you can get started with InVideo AI, the world's most intuitive video creation platform. This video is brought to you by InVideo AI. Just enter a simple prompt into the generator, and InVideo AI turns it into a publish-ready video in under five minutes. We entered a prompt to make a three-minute video. Our prompt was create a video on how the Blitz affected wartime London, create the video using an authoritative male voiceover, and add authentic footage of London during the Second World War and the aircraft used during the Blitz. The federal government's power expanded considerably during the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt, who came to office in 1901 after the assassination of William McKinley. Roosevelt sought to break up the monopolies or trusts, which enabled the likes of Rockefeller and Carnegie to amass immense wealth. And in 1908, his attorney general, Charles Bonaparte, set up an agency called the Bureau of Investigation to investigate violations of antitrust law. By the time John Edgar was 12, he began to work as a delivery boy at the nearby Eastern Market outside school hours, helping customers take their heavy bags of produce home. His realization that he could make more deliveries and more money by carrying out his tasks quicker engendered a sense of speed and efficiency in his later career. In September 1909, 14-year-old Hoover entered Central High School, the most prestigious of Washington's white high schools. In addition to reading, Writing and mathematics, the school taught a broad curriculum, encompassing modern images, history, drawing, and music. He maintained his record of academic success and was a diligent student who scored excellent grades in almost every subject. The school also emphasized physical activities, and after failing to make the football team, who ever joined the cadet corps? thriving in an environment of discipline and order. Hoover was also a member of the successful debate team, as with his teammates in the Library of Congress missions. Although two-thirds of the student body were girls, Hoover was more comfortable among boys. Hoover's distance from the female students might have been prompted by the teachings of Donald McLeod, pastor of the Presbyterian Church, who promoted abstinence and self-control among young men. Hoover was also influenced by McLeod's support for racial segregation and his belief that the salvation of humanity lay in religion rather than in greater political rights.
During his final year at Central High in 1913, Hoover graduated as valedictorian and led the debate team to further success. As captain of Company A in the cadets, he led the boys down Pennsylvania Avenue during President Woodrow Wilson's inaugural parade in March 1913. While his classmates went off to Ivy League universities, Hoover had to take a job as a clerk at the Library of Congress while attending night classes to study law at George Washington University. While Hoover continued to do well in his university studies, he joined the Kappa Alpha Fraternity, founded by Southerners to promote the lost cause myth, the idea that the South had not fought the Civil War to defend slavery, but rather to protect its agrarian way of life from the depredations of the corrupt industrialized North. Many of these views had been shared by President Wilson, the first president to hail from the South since the Civil War. Soon after coming to office, Wilson approved the segregation of federal employees in the federal capital. At the same time, Wilson continued his rival Theodore Roosevelt's legacy of expanding federal power to curb the excesses of wealthy businessmen, setting up the Federal Reserve System and the Federal Trade Commission in 1913. When John Edgar Hoover began working for the Library of Congress in October 1913, at the age of 18, he began a 59-year career in government service that would only end with his death in 1972. His job involved sorting and classifying new books and materials, which arrived in the library's collection according to a filing system, introduced by Chief Librarian Herbert Putnam, known appropriately as the Library of Congress system. Hoover was impressed by Putnam's hands-on leadership and his experience at the library led him to appreciate the importance of filing and classifying documents. Through his university course and his association with Kappa Alpha, Hoover began to meet prominent politicians from the South. John Abercrombie, a Democratic congressman from Alabama, would serve as an important political patron during the early years of his career. After graduating with a Bachelor of Laws degree in 1916, Hoover decided to stay on for one more year to obtain a master's degree. By 1970, the war had been waging in Europe for over two years, despite German submarine attack on Atlipping, which claimed more than a hundred American lives. Wilson resisted British and French pleas to join the war against Germany until April 1917. Two months later, Hoover graduated from law school and started work in the Justice Department, with a draft exemption 26th of July. He worked within the War Emergency Division and was involved in determining whether Germans suspected of disloyalty to the United States would be interned or released. Suspects were brought to Hoover by the Bureau of Investigation. In June 1917, Congress passed the Espionage Act, which gave the federal government the authority to crack down on opposition to the war. Accordingly, the Justice Department took action against left-wing anarchists and communists who participated in anti-war protests. When President Wilson announced that German-born men who were not U.S. citizens had to register with the government, in February 1918, Hoover coordinated the registration work in New York City. After the end of the First World War in November 1918, Hoover remained at the Justice Department, and in March 1919, he became a special assistant to Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer. Although the Germans interned during the war were soon released, the threat from communism appeared to increase. In November 1917, the Bolshevik Party had overthrown the liberal provisional government in Russia, establishing the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, the first communist government in the world. In March 1919, Bolshevik leader Vladimir Lenin established the Third International, or Comintern, which promoted international revolution. Palmer believed that foreign immigrants were responsible for radicalizing the U.S. labor movement and sought authority to deport them, and Hoover owed his appointment as Palmer's special advisor to his connections with John Abercrombie, then serving as solicitor and acting secretary of the Labor Department with responsibility for immigration. In early June 1919, an anarchist bomb destroyed Palmer's house as part of a coordinated campaign targeting government officials. On the 1st of July, Palmer asked Hoover to lead the Bureau of Investigation's newly created Radical Division, 
with the responsibility for coordinating between the justice and labor departments to deport political extremists. Applying his experience from the Library of Congress, Hoover started by instituting a new filing system to keep track of documents. Hoover personally gathered evidence on Emma Goldman, one of the country's most prominent anarchists, and argued for Goldman's deportation at a hearing in New York on the 18th of October. The case went to the Supreme Court, which ruled in favor of deportation on the 11th of December. On the 20th of December, Goldman and her ally, Alexander Berkman, were among 249 anarchists deported to Soviet Russia. Palmer and Hoover immediately turned their attention to the Communist Party and the Communist Labour Party of America. After compiling a list of foreign-born communists, Hoover requested 3,000 deportation warrants, which were signed off by Abercrombie on the 27th of December. On the 2nd of January, the Bureau agents led raids across the country and made over 3,000 arrests. Both Palmer and Hoover were hailed by the press, but after Abercrombie's departure from the Labour Department in March, his successor, Louis Post, rescinded over 2,000 warrants and denounced the raids as unlawful. Although Hoover attempted to distance himself from the raids and change the name of his organization to the more neutral General Intelligence Division, Palmer told the Senate in early 1921 that Hoover had been responsible for organizing the raids. In March 1921, Republican Warren Harding took office as president. As part of the Democratic administration, Hoover feared for his job, but decided to stay in his post under the new Attorney General, Harding's campaign manager, Harry Daugherty. In August, Daugherty appointed private detective William Burns as director of the Bureau of Investigation, with Hoover as assistant director. During his three years as assistant director, Hoover established a system for organizing fingerprints, instituted special training for bureau agents, and forbade junior agents from speaking to the press. Although Burns previously enjoyed a reputation for efficiency, the Justice Department during the Harding administration was a hotbed of corruption. The scandal broke after Harding's sudden death on the 2nd of August 1923, when it emerged that the administration had taken bribes to lease out the Teapot Dome oil reserve in Wyoming. When Daugherty refused to investigate the allegations, the Senate began an investigation into the Justice Department in March 1924, which uncovered systematic corruption and abuse of power by Daugherty and Burns. Though Hoover later denied knowledge of the corruption, as Burns' deputy, it is unlikely he was completely ignorant. After President Coolidge dismissed Daugherty in March 1924, named director of the Bureau of Investigation on the 10th of May, the new Attorney General, Harlan Fisk, stirred political surveillance and abolished the General Intelligence Division. Hoover dismissed the Bureau's more notorious agents and stipulated that new recruits should have qualifications in law or accountancy. On the 10th of December, Hoover was confirmed as director of the Bureau on a permanent basis and continued his efforts to professionalize the agency. Contrasting its agents with local policemen, whom he regarded as drunk, incompetent here, while many policemen joined the gangsters in evading the ban on alcohol, Hoover dismissed bureau agents caught drinking. To improve the bureau's efficiency, he encouraged federal and local authorities to share information as part of his continued work to establish a national database of fingerprints. After Harlan Stone was appointed to the Supreme Court in January 1925, Hoover appointed Harold Nathan as his assistant director. He also tapped into his networks at George Washington Law School and Kappa Alpha. In March 1928, he hired Clyde Tolson, a government clerk and a GW law graduate from Missouri, who would become Hoover's closest associate in his professional and personal life. Soon after his appointment, Nathan introduced a rating system to measure the efficiency of bureau employees 
who were subject to inspection twice a year. Hoover's demands for agents to work unpaid overtime, as well as his tendency to reassign agents across the country at short notice, meant that most agents were single, unmarried men. Hoover himself remained unmarried and continued to live with his widowed mother at Seawood Square. Despite having a female secretary, Helen Gandhi, his relationships with younger male subordinates were far more intimate. As part of his personal reorganization, Hoover exhibited his conservative views by dismissing female agents and demoting African Americans to work as chauffeurs and valets. By the late 1920s, Hoover was well on his way to creating an organization that pursued his own agenda, free from political control. In March 1929, the newly inaugurated Republican president, Herbert Hoover, no relation to John Edgar, spoke of the need for the federal government to tackle organized crime. The Bureau of Investigation's remit was relatively limited, and the president ensured it remained that way to avoid political controversies, leaving enforcement of prohibition to the Treasury and organized crime to the states. Instead, John Edgar Hoover worked with the police to establish a national system for crime statistics. The administration's focus on crime was soon superseded by economics during the Great Depression of the early 1930s. In 1932, Hoover invested his limited budget in the creation of a forensic laboratory that opened in November under the leadership of Special Agent Charles Appel. President Herbert Hoover's inability to drag the country out of economic depression led to his defeat in the 1932 presidential election to Democratic candidate Franklin D. Roosevelt, a distant cousin of Theodore Roosevelt. As Roosevelt spent his first hundred days in office dealing with a banking crisis, ending prohibition and introducing unemployment insurance, Hoover was an afterthought. On the 17th of June, 1933, three gangsters killed four law enforcement officers, including a bureau agent at Union Station in Kansas City, Missouri. Hoover responded by opening an inquiry and making it his top priority. On the 29th of July, Attorney General Homer Cummings reappointed Hoover as director. A week earlier, oil executive Charles Urschel had been kidnapped in Oklahoma City. Following Urschel's release, after making a large ransom payment, he assisted the Bureau's agents in tracking down the Tennessee gangster George Kelly Barnes, nicknamed Machine Gun Kelly. Kelly was arrested in September 1933 and spent the rest of his life in prison. In his efforts to create an organization of professional detectives, Hoover discouraged his agents from carrying guns, but Attorney General Cummings agents should receive firearms training. When Cummings expanded the remit of the Bureau to include bank robbery, kidnapping and murder, Hoover claimed he lacked jurisdiction. In March 1934, Notorious bank robber John Dillinger escaped from Indiana prison in a stolen car. As car theft was the Bureau's responsibility, Hoover was forced to intervene and entrusted the case to his young protégé, Martin Purvis, head of the Bureau's Chicago office. On the 9th of April, the Bureau arrested Dillinger's girlfriend, but Dillinger himself escaped. When agents tracked Dillinger down to Little Bohemia in Wisconsin, the operation to apprehend him on the 22nd of April proved a disaster. Not only did Dillinger escape, but a civilian and an agent were killed. The Roosevelt administration responded by passing legislation to expand federal jurisdiction for bank robbery and kidnapping. In the meantime, Dillinger remained at large until Hoover's agents intercepted and killed him at the Biograph Theater in Chicago on the 22nd of July. Following the Dillinger case, Federal agents increasingly used torture tactics on prisoners, including physical beatings, sleep deprivation, and other forms of intimidation. Hoover redoubled his efforts in investigating the Kansas City case, identifying Pretty Boy Floyd as the chief suspect. Agents from Purvis's Chicago office killed Floyd in an Ohio farmhouse on the 22nd of October. Although Purvis was given credit for the operation, much of the investigative work was carried out by Sam Cowley, a lawyer in the Washington office, whom Hoover had dispatched to Chicago to help with the Dillinger case. On the 27th of November, Cowley and a fellow agent tracked down Babyface Nelson, one of Dillinger's associates. 
During the ensuing shootout, all three men were killed. A depressed Hoover came to the realization that his agents had to be skillful shots as well as having technical and legal expertise. As part of Hoover's efforts to professionalize law enforcement in the country, in the summer of 1935, he set up the FBI National Academy to train police officers in FBI methods. The academy would go on to serve as a fertile recruiting ground for future agents. Following Hoover's success in eliminating some of the country's most notorious criminals, Roosevelt asked him to be more proactive in explaining the role of federal law enforcement to the public. As part of this PR initiative, the Bureau, which had been briefly renamed as the Division of Investigation, was renamed the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Hoover suggested that FBI also stood for fidelity, bravery, integrity. After Hollywood executives reached an agreement with Hoover to make films that promoted government narratives rather than celebrating gangsters as romantic heroes, Warner Brothers released G-Men in April 1935 portraying Hoover and his agents as heroic federal crime fighters. Hoover became a national hero and opened the FBI offices to public tours, which attracted up to a thousand people every day. At the end of 1935, Hoover converted the Crime Records Division into a public relations unit led by Clyde Tolson, who emerged as Hoover's right-hand man during this period. Five years younger than Hoover, Tolson had been promoted to assistant director alongside Harold Nathan in 1930. He was in charge of personnel and worked closely with Hoover, and by 1935 they regularly went out together on social occasions. Hoover's fame as director of the FBI increased public scrutiny of his personal life, but while he and Tolson attended parties hosted by New York gossip columnist Walter Winchell, the latter dismissed rumors of a homosexual relationship. Based on photos from their vacations together, Hoover's latest biographer Beverly Gage argued that there was indeed an erotic intimacy between the two. When FBI agents tracked down the gangster Alvin Karpis in New Orleans, Hoover and Tolson appeared on the scene on the 1st of May 1936, responding to criticism from a Democratic senator that he had never arrested anyone. Hoover was present to carry out the final arrest. In July 1936, Hoover created the position of assistant to the director for Tolson, making him Hoover's undisputed deputy. Hoover's presumed homosexuality contrasted with his promotion of socially conservative Christian moral values in lectures to social organizations. He launched a high-profile crackdown on prostitution and was on the ground with Tolson when more than a hundred clients were rounded up by FBI agents in August 1937 in a raid on the brothels of Atlantic City, New Jersey. While Roosevelt managed to... The Great Depression fueled support for extremist parties in Europe. In 1933, Adolf Hitler's fascist Nazi party had taken power in Germany and began to persecute Jews and other minorities whom they blamed for Germany's social and economic ills. By 1936, communist parties joined popular fronts that entered government in France and Spain. As Roosevelt ran for re-election in 1936, he feared the threat of communism and fascism on American shores and sought Hoover's advice. The FBI director suggested reviving the political surveillance function abolished in 1924, but advised doing so in secret to avoid the public outcry after the Palmer raids. While Hoover investigated the youth camps run by the German-American Bund, modelled on the Hitler Youth, he was more concerned about the resurgent Communist Party and claimed that it was responsible for encouraging strikes in the steel, mining and automotive industries. In February 1938, a German immigrant, Gunther Rumrich, was arrested in New York for stealing passports and confessed to being a Nazi spy. The espionage case was entrusted to the FBI, whose agents rounded up 18 suspects for questioning before releasing them ahead of a grand jury. Though the FBI had carried out similar procedures in its investigation of gangsters, 14 of the suspects managed to flee the country. Once again, despite the FBI's failure, Roosevelt and Cummings offered to strengthen the FBI's powers. After presenting Roosevelt with the evidence he gathered on fascist and communist activity since 1936, Hoover secured the FBI's position 
As the country's leading counter-espionage agency, Hoover's increased responsibilities at work coincided with major changes in his private life. Following the death of his mother Annie in February 1938, he sold his childhood home in Seawood Square and moved to the northwest neighborhood, a short drive from Tolson's apartment. On the 1st of September 1939, a week after signing a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union, Germany invaded Poland. After a couple of days, Britain and France declared war on Germany, marking the outbreak of the Second World War in Europe, and the FBI's role in counter-espionage activities was publicly revealed on the 6th of September. Working under Attorney General Frank Murphy, Hoover re-established the General Intelligence Division and created a card index of candidates for internment. Although Hoover sought to avoid the mistakes of 20 years earlier, progressives and liberals claimed that Hoover was becoming too powerful and likened the FBI to the Gestapo, Hitler's secret police. When Murphy was appointed to the Supreme Court in January 1940, his successor Robert Jackson seemed poised to dismiss Hoover. Amidst press rumors that he was to be fired, Hoover offered to resign, prompting Jackson to issue a statement expressing confidence in the FBI director, while simultaneously asserting the Justice Department's authority over the agency. The surrender of France to Nazi Germany in July 1940, after six weeks of fighting, shocked the world, and Roosevelt responded by building up war production and expanding counter-espionage activities. In defiance of Hoover's liberal critics, Roosevelt authorized FBI wiretapping and passed the Alien Registration Act to force foreign-born residents to register with the government. Additionally, Roosevelt asked the FBI to conduct counter-espionage operations in Latin America, where the Germans were suspected of establishing their own intelligence network. To deal with the increased wartime workload, the FBI's employee count rapidly increased from under 2,500 in January 1940 to almost 5,600 in June 1941, while its budget grew to $25 million in 1942. The FBI set up wiretaps in foreign embassies and recruited informants to infiltrate factories, labor unions, and civil rights organizations. Hoover also cooperated with British intelligence and sent FBI agents to London and Canada for training. The FBI was able to maintain surveillance on a wide network of Nazi operatives through its double agent, William Siebold, and on the 28th of June 1941, the FBI rounded up more than 30 Nazi spies and charged them under the Espionage Act. Despite this triumph, the FBI's cooperation with the British tailed off, as the latter preferred to work with Bill Donovan, the head of the Office of the Coordinator of Information, soon renamed the Office of Strategic Services. On the morning of the 7th of December 1941, Japanese aircraft launched a surprise attack on the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Hoover had been tracking Hawaiians of Japanese ancestry for more than a year and was given authority to arrest those who weren't U.S. citizens. Congress declared war on Japan on the 8th of December, and three days later, Hitler declared war on the United States. In the meantime, the FBI arrested thousands of Germans, Italians, and Japanese suspects and sent them to internment camps all over the country. While the FBI's arrest of Japanese, German, and Italian nationals was relatively limited, Roosevelt's War Department proposed interning all persons of Japanese descent, regardless of citizenship. Hoover considered this counterproductive and enlisted the support of the Liberal Attorney General Francis Biddle, who had been appointed in late 1941 after Jackson's elevation to the Supreme Court. Despite Hoover presenting evidence suggesting that most Japanese Americans were not disloyal, in February 1942, Roosevelt signed an executive order authorizing the army to relocate more than 120,000 Japanese Americans, mainly from the West Coast, to detention camps in the interior. On the 12th of June 1942, the U.S. Coast Guard encountered suspected German saboteurs landing on Long Island, New York and soon discovered a stash of explosives. The FBI took control of the investigation, and a week later a man named George Dash informed the FBI that he was one of eight men ordered by the Nazi government to destroy military facilities and public infrastructure in what was known as Operation Pastorius. 
Dash and three companions landed in Long Island, while the second group of four headed for Florida. The FBI encouraged Dash to give details of the plot, and by the 27th of June, all eight men were captured. That evening, Hoover and Tolson orchestrated a PR triumph for the FBI, sensationalizing the threat while neglecting to mention the Coast Guard's role, nor Dash's assistance. Roosevelt set up a military tribunal to hear the case, seeking to execute all eight prisoners. Although Hoover had promised Dash a presidential pardon, the latter was convinced that he had been betrayed. In fact, Hoover did encourage Roosevelt to spare Dash and his associate Peter Berger, who also helped the investigation. While the remaining six were swiftly executed, Dash was sentenced to 30 years and Berger to life imprisonment. And in 1948, both men were deported to Germany. The Pastorius case was Hoover's greatest triumph during the war, and the FBI's responsibilities continued to expand under Roosevelt. Among these new duties, Hoover was asked to investigate homosexuality among government employees, whom Roosevelt believed might be susceptible to blackmail from foreign agents. This unsavory task was complicated by Hoover's own private life, and he attempted to quell rumors of government officials being dismissed due to homosexual inclinations. Roosevelt also asked Hoover to take a look at racial discrimination in the country, fearing that it would undermine wartime national unity. Although Hoover continued to believe in the superiority of the white race, he cooperated with the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, ordered agents to investigate lynchings in the South, and instructed police officers to take racial violence seriously. On the 6th of June 1944, American troops were among the Allied forces landing on the beaches of Normandy, paving the way for the liberation of France and the invasion of Germany. After being elected to a fourth term in November, Roosevelt died on the 12th of April 1945, less than a month before Germany's surrender. In early August, Roosevelt's successor, Harry Truman, ordered the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, leading to Japan's surrender a week later on the 15th of August. Before Roosevelt's death, Hoover proposed that the FBI should take over peacetime international intelligence operations, sidelining, if not completely eliminating, Donovan's Office of Strategic Services. On the 20th of September, Truman abolished the OSS, leaving Hoover seemingly triumphant. However, on the 22nd of January 1946, Truman announced the creation of the Central Intelligence Group, bringing together operatives from the state, war, and navy departments. The new organization would have the responsibility for international intelligence, while the FBI retained control over domestic intelligence. When Truman ordered the FBI to disband its intelligence operations in Latin America and transfer its facilities to the Central Intelligence Group, a bitter Hoover ordered his operatives to destroy everything they had gathered and to return to the United States within a month. In July 1947, the Central Intelligence Group became the Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA. After being frustrated in his ambitions to claim a global role for his agency, Hoover sought to demonstrate to Truman and the country that the FBI still had an important role to play domestically. Although lynchings in the South had declined during the war, a new wave began in 1946. In July, a family of four African Americans, among them a veteran of the recent war, had been killed in Georgia. Though the FBI's efforts to bring the perpetrators to justice had been foiled by a white population who routinely acquitted suspects in grand juries, Hoover was determined to get to the bottom of the case. Nevertheless, despite interviewing almost 2,800 witnesses and identifying 10 suspects, the FBI only managed to secure a single indictment for lying to the FBI. The Bureau was more successful in securing the indictment of 31 people for the murder of a black man, Willie Earle, in South Carolina in February 1947. But a trial in May once again resulted in acquittal for all suspects. In his testimony to Truman's Committee on Civil Rights, Hoover demanded a federal law to facilitate the FBI's lynching investigations. In 1948, Truman urged Congress to pass a federal anti-lynching law and desegregated the military by executive order, but Southern Democrats blocked any progress on lynching.
While Congress was unwilling to expand the FBI's jurisdiction on lynching, it was far more willing to support Hoover's anti-communist crusade. Although the Soviet Union had been a wartime ally after its invasion by Germany in June 1941, Hoover continued surveillance of American communists. The FBI claimed that the Soviets had not only infiltrated labor and civil rights organizations, but were firmly embedded in military facilities and government departments. On the 7th of November, Soviet spy Elizabeth Bentley defected to the FBI and gave the names of nearly 150 Soviet spies, including Harry Dexter White at the Treasury, a prominent player in the Bretton Woods Conference on the Future of the Global Economic System. Bentley's information echoed that of Whitaker Chambers, former communist and journalist for Time magazine, who had named State Department official Alga Hiss, who chaired the conference that established the United Nations. Though the FBI assigned 250 agents to investigate Bentley's claims, they found no tangible evidence. Truman dismissed Hoover's warnings and appointed White as the American director of the International Monetary Fund. A bitterly disappointed Hoover responded by turning to the resurgent Republican Party in Congress for support. At the same time, he reached out to the House Un-American Activities Committee, which had been formed in 1938 to investigate fascist and communist subversion. On the 26th of March, he testified before the House Un-American Activities Committee, setting out the threat of communism to American liberal democracy. The FBI supplied the House Un-American Activities Committee with evidence when the committee held public hearings in late 1947 on the subject of communist influence in Hollywood. Walt Disney and Ronald Reagan, then president of the Screen Actors Guild, were among the public figures who worked with the FBI and supported Hoover's assertion that the US film industry was full of communists. When 10 witnesses refused to answer whether they were members of the Communist Party, the committee's investigators presented their party membership cards and the Hollywood 10 were charged with contempt of Congress. Following the hearings, Hollywood executives blacklisted communist sympathizers from working in the industry. In the meantime, Hoover continued to seek advice corroborating information from Elizabeth Bentley and other informants. In late 1947, U.S. Army intelligence began to decrypt intercepted Soviet messages collected during the war, and Hoover agreed to support the operation codenamed Venona. In July 1948, Hoover secured indictments of 12 leaders of the Communist Party under the wartime Alien Registration Act, also known as the Smith Act. Later that month, Elizabeth Bentley testified before the House Un-American Activities Committee, naming Harry Dexter White. A few days later, Whitaker Chambers appeared before the committee with his allegations against Alger Hiss. An enraged Hiss requested the right to defend himself and appeared before the House Un-American Activities Committee on the 5th of August, vehemently denying he was a member of the Communist Party. Harry Dexter White gave his testimony on the 13th, three days before his death from a heart attack. Hoover was ill with pneumonia while the Hiss case held the country's attention, and in December, Hiss was indicted for perjury after Chambers provided the House Un-American Activities Committee with a further cache of documents. Hoover was disappointed that it was the House Un-American Activities Committee rather than the FBI which uncovered the key evidence that condemned his. However, almost immediately, he was informed that a Soviet spy mentioned in the Venona cables was identified as Judith Coplin, an employee of the Department of Justice's Foreign Agents Registration Section, who would have compromised the FBI. Hoover authorized the surveillance of Coplin and her social contacts and baited her with a fake report, leading to the arrest of Coplin and her Soviet handler on the 4th of March 1949. Over the course of 1949, the FBI would secure convictions in all three cases, the Smith Act, the Hiss Trials, and the Coplin case. When the latter had her convictions overturned on appeal, Hoover decided to drop the case, fearing that it would compromise Venona, which remained secret from Truman and the CIA. In late August 1949, the Soviet Union conducted its first nuclear test. Just over a month later, Mao Zedong's Chinese Communist Party 
took power in China. Both developments were taken as signs that America was losing the Cold War. The ideological struggle between the Soviet Union and the United States for global influence. The Venona decrypts indicated that the Soviets had knowledge of the American Manhattan Project, which led to the de development of the nuclear bomb. The FBI and British intelligence initially secured the conviction of physicist Klaus Fuchs, who enabled the FBI to go after his American handler, Harry Gold. The trail eventually led to New York engineer Julius Rosenberg and his wife, Ethel, who could now be matched with the code names of operatives mentioned in the Venona cables. The FBI arrested Julius on the 17th of July and Ethel on the 11th of August, but neither would cooperate. The two were tried on the 6th of March 1951, found guilty and sentenced to death. When left-leaning intellectuals from around the world campaigned to reverse the verdict, Hoover hoped that the Rosenbergs might be persuaded to talk, but both met their end in the electric chair on the 19th of June 1953. Though the Venona cables helped the FBI prosecute the sensational Rosenberg case, Hoover was frustrated that many suspected Soviet agents slipped the net. Just after the conclusion of the Rosenberg trial, the Venona team uncovered the identities of two Soviet spies working for British intelligence, Guy Burgess and Donald McLean, both of whom had been attached to the British embassy in Washington. The two men soon disappeared and defected to the Soviet Union. Hoover then came to the alarming realization that Kim Philby, the British liaison to the FBI, was also working with the Soviets. Philby had been given access to the Venona decrypts and would have given the Soviet authorities advance notice to protect their assets. Philby was soon recalled to Britain but continued to maintain his innocence until his defection in 1962. Hoover's efforts to protect the confidentiality of Venona were also undermined by Wisconsin Senator Joseph McCarthy's anti-communist campaign in the Senate. When McCarthy claimed that the FBI had evidence on Soviet spies, Hoover appeared before a Senate committee defending the confidentiality of FBI files. Hoover preferred to work with Nevada Democratic Senator Patrick McCarran, who created the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee and was more methodical in his approach to dealing with suspected Soviet spies. In November 1952, World War II Commander General Dwight D. Eisenhower was elected president as the Republican candidate. The new president was happy to keep Hoover in post and supported his pursuit of communist agents. Hoover welcomed the fact that Eisenhower's vice president was Richard Nixon, who had sat on the House Un-American Activities Committee as a California congressman and had worked with Hoover on the Hiss case. During the Eisenhower years, Hoover entered an accommodation with the CIA, headed by Alan Dulles, the brother of Eisenhower's Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles. In November 1953, Eisenhower and Brownell allowed Hoover to revive his case against the late Harry Dexter White, initiating a high-profile public clash with Truman in which Hoover emerged victorious. Republican control of Congress enabled McCarthy to resume his anti-communist campaign. Though initially cooperative, Hoover cut ties with McCarthy after the senator poached an FBI agent as an investigator. When McCarthy criticized the Eisenhower administration for not being tough enough on communists in the army, Hoover helped to ensure McCarthy's demise by refusing to confirm the authenticity of an FBI letter that the senator relied on during congressional hearings in 1954. In 1954, Supreme Court Chief Justice Earl Warren ruled in Brown v. Board of Education that racial segregation in schools was unconstitutional. Despite his personal views, Hoover was required to enforce the new ruling, but encountered the usual obstacles from Southern society. Although Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1957 to strengthen federal enforcement of civil rights, local authorities were unwilling to cooperate with the FBI. As he turned back to his anti-communist crusade, Hoover received unexpected support from Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, who denounced the purges and personality cult of his predecessor Joseph Stalin in a speech to party officials in February 1956. Khrushchev's speech undermined American communism, and by 1957, the Supreme Court made a series of rulings to limit the FBI's ability to go after communists. 
Hoover warned against complacency and in 1956 established the secret COINTELPRO, short for counterintelligence program, which aimed to ferment division in the Communist Party. In 1958, Morris Childs, one of the FBI's agents in the Communist Party, was invited to meet the Soviet leadership in Moscow before calling on Mao Zedong in Beijing on his return, providing Hoover with valuable intelligence which he duly passed on to Eisenhower. In the 1960 presidential election, Hoover's friend, Vice President Richard Nixon, was narrowly defeated by John F. Kennedy, the young Democratic senator from Massachusetts. Hoover was unimpressed by Kennedy, whose frequent sexual affairs threatened to compromise him as president. He was far happier with Kennedy's vice president, Texas Senator Lyndon B. Johnson, a neighbor of almost 20 years who was sympathetic to the FBI as Senate Majority Leader. After the president appointed his 35-year-old brother, Robert Kennedy, as Attorney General, Hoover was appalled by Bobby's unprofessional manner and his habit of calling at the FBI offices without prior notice. On a more fundamental level, Hoover opposed Bobby's proposals for a crime commission to tackle organized crime, resenting the insinuation that the FBI was not doing enough. Although Hoover had previously denied the existence of an American mafia, by the 1950s the Bureau had been secretly gathering evidence and wiretapping mafia bosses in Chicago. After Hoover met with both Kennedys, in April 1961, Bobby dropped the Crime Commission proposal and instead advocated for increasing the FBI's enforcement powers. On the 17th of April, the CIA-backed invasion of communist Cuba at the Bay of Pigs proved a fiasco, allowing Hoover a perfect opportunity to attack the agency's incompetence. The following day, Hoover received information that the CIA had sought assistance from the Mafia, and Bobby Kennedy confirmed to Hoover that Chicago mobster Sam Giancana had been approached by the CIA to assassinate Cuban communist leader Fidel Castro. The FBI's interrogation of Giancana revealed the Kennedy's links to organized crime, information which Hoover kept under wraps. Hoover and Bobby's relations were also strained by the continued challenge of civil rights enforcement. In May 1961, civil rights activists launched the Freedom Rides campaign, taking buses into the South to test whether desegregation would be enforced. Although the FBI had informants in the Ku Klux Klan who warned of an attack in Birmingham, Alabama on the 14th of May, the local police failed to take action when the buses were attacked. When Bobby requested FBI assistance in protecting the riders, Hoover refused and limited the Bureau to gathering evidence. While the Klan considered Hoover an enemy, the FBI continued its surveillance of civil rights leaders based on Hoover's belief that the movement was being radicalized by communists. Through its informant Morris Childs and his brother Jack, for several years the FBI had been interested in Stanley Leveson, a New York businessman and financial backer of the Communist Party, who by the early 1960s was serving as an advisor to Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., the leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, who served as the Kennedy White House's conduit to the civil rights movement. In early 1962, Hoover informed the Kennedys of King's communist links, hoping that the White House encouraged the civil rights leader to quietly remove Leveson and Jack O'Dell, another of King's advisors who was suspected of being a secret member of the Communist Party leadership. In the following months, King understated O'Dell's role and accused FBI agents of bias and sympathy with the segregationists. While Hoover responded by transferring some northern agents to the south, he increasingly regarded King as a dangerous man and launched a personal vendetta. In the spring of 1963, King organized civil disobedience demonstrations in Birmingham, but FBI surveillance of Leveson indicated that King was planning a march on Washington to call for stronger federal civil rights legislation. When Hoover passed this information to Kennedy, on the 11th of June, the president decided to seize the initiative by proposing a comprehensive federal civil rights law to desegregate all public spaces. A few days later, the Kennedys once again urged King to dismiss Odell and Leveson. While acknowledging Odell's communist affiliations, King stood by Leveson in the absence of conclusive proof. 
which Huber refused to provide in order to protect his sources. On the 28th of August, 1963, King led a march on Washington, delivering his famous I Have a Dream speech to a crowd of over 250,000 people. The event caused Hoover to focus on King himself as a threat to national security, and he authorized the wiretapping of King's home and office. While racial violence continued to engulf the South, President Kennedy was shot and killed in Dallas, Texas, on the 22nd of November 1963. After initially instructing FBI agents in Texas to track down right-wing extremists, after Dallas police detained Lee Harvey Oswald as the chief suspect less than an hour later, Hoover ordered his men to focus on Oswald. Though the FBI already had a file on Oswald due to his brief stay in the Soviet Union and his Russian wife, they did not consider him an active threat. While Hoover was prepared to believe that Oswald was a communist who acted alone in gunning down Kennedy, that evening he received instructions from President Lyndon Johnson to carry out a thorough investigation into the late president's death. The following day, Hoover ordered his agents to work on establishing Oswald's guilt, an approach that may have reflected a desire to protect the FBI's surveillance of communists and organized crime. On the 24th, while Oswald was being escorted by Dallas police to a more secure detention facility, he was fatally shot by Jack Ruby, a nightclub operator in Dallas. Oswald's death frustrated Hoover's hopes that he could get the investigation over with quickly and fueled speculation and alternative theories. Although Johnson hoped that the investigation into Kennedy's death would remain in the hands of the FBI, he bowed to political pressure and established a special commission under Chief Justice Earl Warren. On the 9th of December, the FBI delivered a 400-page report with information on Oswald's links with Cuba and a recent trip to the Soviet embassy in Mexico City, leaving out any information unrelated to Oswald. Moreover, while the report acknowledged that the FBI had known about Oswald, it did not reflect Hoover's personal belief that his agents had been negligent prior to the assassination. When the commission criticized the FBI's reports for not being thorough enough, Hoover responded by flooding the commission with thousands of pages of evidence uncovered during the investigation. At the same time, an indignant Hoover aimed to suppress a false rumor heard by the commission in January 1964 that Oswald had been an FBI informant. Despite hostility from the Warren Commission, Hoover retained Johnson's support, and on the 8th of May, the president exempted him from mandatory retirement at the age of 70. On the 14th, Hoover testified before the Warren Commission, defending the view that Oswald had acted alone, and the commission's final report in December echoed the FBI's conclusions. As he prepared for the 1964 presidential campaign, Johnson sought to continue his predecessor's agenda and aimed to pass the civil rights legislation that Kennedy championed in the final months of his presidency. In the meantime, the FBI claimed that as a result of its surveillance, it had found that King was having several extramarital affairs and participated in sex parties, reports that Hoover shared with Congress off the record. When the Johnson administration expressed fears that Hoover's innuendos would imperil the president's civil rights agenda, Hoover backed off. After passing the House and the Senate, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was signed by President Johnson on the 2nd of July, with Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King in attendance. Days later, Johnson ordered Hoover to go to Mississippi to secure a commitment from state leaders to enforce the new legislation. The Civil Rights Act changed the country's politics overnight. In the November presidential election, Johnson defeated right-wing Republican candidate Senator Barry Goldwater in a landslide. While Johnson swept most of the country, Goldwater won the conservative South, previously a Democratic heartland. Hoover welcomed Johnson's re-election and was glad to see Bobby Kennedy resign as Attorney General in September, before being elected Senator for New York. With the election out of the way, Hoover resumed his vendetta against Martin Luther King, telling a group of female reporters on the 18th of November that King was the most notorious liar in the country due to his criticism of the FBI's actions in the South. Though the remark outraged liberals, Johnson stood by the FBI director, telling an aide, it's probably better to have him inside the tent pissing out than outside pissing in. 
the FBI continued the campaign, sending an anonymous letter to King on the 21st of November, accusing him of adulterous acts and sexual orgies, before ending with the ominous phrase, King, there is only one thing left for you to do. You know what it is. You have just 34 days. Seemingly a suggestion that King should end his own life by Christmas. Despite a seemingly cordial meeting with King on the 1st of December, during which he declared his full sympathy with the civil rights movement, Hoover authorized his agents to continue the campaign against King. The controversy did little to dent his popularity in the country, and his approval rating stood at around 80%. Though Hoover could not tell King openly, in July 1964, he launched a COINTELPRO campaign, codenamed White Hate, targeting the Ku Klux Klan seeking to break the organization by the same methods he used against the Communist Party. Although the FBI informants managed to prevent some attacks, it failed to prevent the Klan's shooting of Viola Liuzzo, a white woman who was driving civil rights activists back to Selma, Alabama, after joining King's march to the state capital of Montgomery on the 25th of March. The FBI immediately solved the case, since its informant Gary Rowe was in the offending vehicle. Without pausing to ask why Roe had not intervened to prevent the shooting, Hoover and Johnson heralded the case as a success for federal law enforcement. Over the next three years, the FBI's efforts led to the disintegration of the Klan. The racial violence in the South was part of a national increase in violent crime during the 1960s, which troubled Hoover. According to the FBI's data, the murder rate doubled between 1963 and 1968. Although Johnson had called for a war on crime in 1965, at the same time the President and the Supreme Court obliged Hoover to limit wiretapping. Hoover also had to contend with the New Left movement, dominated by liberal students who supported civil rights and opposed the increasing American military presence in Vietnam, where the US armed forces were propping up anti-communist South Vietnam against communist North Vietnam. In July 1967, Johnson asked Illinois Governor Otto Kerner to chair a commission into the causes of the civil disorder that was sweeping the country. In his testimony to the commission, Hoover placed the blame on communists, students, and black rights activists. When the Kerner Commission reported in February 1968, it concluded that white racism and the lack of opportunities for ethnic minorities were primarily at fault. While acknowledging that communism was no longer the driving force behind the violence, Hoover disagreed and initiated a COINTELPRO program to focus on the student protesters of the New Left. As the death toll in Vietnam piled up with little to show for it, Johnson's popularity was in steady decline. While seeking re-election for a second full term in 1968, Johnson faced a challenge from Bobby Kennedy in the Democratic primaries. In late March, Johnson shocked the nation by proposing peace talks in Vietnam and withdrawing his presidential candidacy. Days later, on the 4th of April 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. Knowing that the FBI's antagonism with King would place the Bureau under suspicion, Hoover sought to leave the investigation to local authorities, only for Attorney General Ramsey Clark to invoke federal jurisdiction. Hoover immediately ordered his agents to action to prove that the FBI was not responsible. Within two weeks, FBI agents used its database to match the fingerprints on the murder weapon with those of James Earl Ray. Although Hoover ordered thousands of agents to track down Ray's whereabouts, the case seemed to run cold. While the nation was still reeling from King's assassination, on the 4th of June, Robert Kennedy was shot while celebrating his victory in the California primary. Bystanders soon apprehended the culprit a man by the name of Sirhan Sirhan, who made no attempt at escape. On the 8th of June, while Kennedy's funeral was being held in New York, Hoover announced that James Earl Ray had been arrested in London. Although much of the work was carried out by Canadian authorities examining passport applications, Hoover was happy to take the credit. Keen to avoid what had happened with Lee Harvey Oswald, Hoover took precautions in bringing Ray back to the United States. After a series of legal delays, two FBI agents accompanied Ray over the Atlantic on the 18th of July. In March 1969, Ray pled guilty, 
but hinted that he had not acted alone, fueling rumors of FBI involvement. Although Johnson's resignation as president caused Hoover to lose a friend in the White House, he was replaced by another, Richard Nixon, who defeated Johnson's vice president, Hubert Humphrey, in the 1968 election. Hoover had supported Nixon's campaign to restore law and order behind the scenes and was glad to have a president who was not only a friend, but also an ideological ally. With Nixon's backing, the FBI accelerated its campaign against black nationalists and student protesters using tried and tested methods of infiltration and division developed through COINTELPRO. Hoover set his sights on the Black Panther Party in particular, a Marxist and black power organization. On the 4th of December 1969, the Chicago police raided the apartment of Fred Hampton, the deputy chair of the Black Panthers, and shot him while he was sleeping in his bed. An FBI informant had drugged Hampton and provided a map of the apartment to the police in advance of the raid. The Hampton killing inspired the creation of the militant Weather Underground Organization, dedicated to overthrowing the American government, further escalating the cycle of violence. Despite the FBI's extensive COINTELPRO operations, which Nixon did not know about, the president believed that Hoover was not doing enough. When Hoover resisted the Nixon administration's efforts to end the FBI's monopoly on domestic counterintelligence, administration officials began to consider whether it was time for the 76-year-old director to move aside. Hoover's position was further damaged on the 8th of March 1971, when burglars broke into a small FBI office in Pennsylvania and carried away documents that exposed COINTELPRO, and Hoover decided to shut down the operation. The revelations exacerbated the decline in Hoover's popularity among liberals, prompting calls for his resignation in the Senate by South Dakota's George McGovern, who would challenge Nixon for the presidency in 1972, and Massachusetts' Ted Kennedy, the surviving Kennedy brother. While Hoover aimed to stage a comeback with support from Nixon's conservative Republican base, relations between Nixon and Hoover further deteriorated in June 1971, when classified documents about the Vietnam War, known as the Pentagon Papers, were leaked to the New York Times. Sensing that the FBI was not investigating the leak intensively enough, Nixon responded by recruiting a team of intelligence operatives, nicknamed the Plumbers, to investigate leaks and carry out dirty tricks operations. In late 1971, Nixon repeatedly sought to persuade Hoover to announce a retirement date, but backed down when Hoover demanded a written presidential instruction. The great political survivor, who led the FBI under eight presidents, was in no hurry to leave office. As he continued to weather the political attacks, John Edgar Hoover died unexpectedly in the early hours of the 2nd of May, at the age of 77. Shortly before his death, Hoover had instructed his secretary, Helen Gandhi, to destroy files on his private life. He left his house and most of his assets to Clyde Tolson, who briefly took the reins at the FBI. The following day, Hoover became the first unelected civil servant to be granted the honor of lying in state in the Capitol building. While Nixon mourned the loss of a personal friend, the timing of Hoover's death was fortuitous for the president, who decided to assert the administration's control of the agency by appointing Assistant Attorney General L. Patrick Gray as acting director. On the 4th of May, Hoover was buried alongside his parents in the Congressional Cemetery in Washington, D.C., the center of federal power where he had lived and worked for his entire life. J. Edgar Hoover is considered one of the most controversial and notorious figures in American history. For the vast majority of his career as one of the most powerful civil servants in the country, Hoover was universally admired by left and right, both as a protector of civil liberties and as a bastion of law and order, a fact reflected in his extraordinary longevity as head of the FBI and its predecessors for almost half a century under eight presidents four Republicans, and four Democrats. Though Hoover is credited for establishing the FBI as the strong arm of the American state, much of this expansion took place under the instructions from progressive Democratic presidents Franklin D. Roosevelt and Lyndon B. Johnson. Following the Bureau's initial success in tackling gangster violence and the failure of southern state authorities 
to enforce federal civil rights legislation. While the FBI under Hoover was responsible for the demise of the Ku Klux Klan, Hoover's personal conservative biases meant that he was more enthusiastic about waging war against black rights activists and communists, and Hoover's FBI achieved its greatest success in the 1950s through the unmasking of Soviet spies in the United States and Britain. However, Hoover's desire to protect the FBI contributed to his reluctance to conduct wider investigations of the assassinations of President Kennedy and Martin Luther King, while his vendetta against the left contributed to an escalation rather than a reduction of violence at the end of his life. What do you think of J. Edgar Hoover? Was he an impartial law enforcement official who helped keep the United States safe from domestic and foreign enemies for more than half a century? Or was he a nefarious figure who was motivated by his political biases to crack down on civil rights and student protesters? Please let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. You guys get to see behind the scenes. <laughs> so, J. Edgar Hoover. First off, the man might not be these documentaries. I'm going to are very powerful because I think it shows how long the FBI is actually. Been most of us didn't realize it at the time. Most of us didn't realize it, and there's a reason why I'm letting this go. But J. Edgar Hoover, right? If he was trying to protect the FBI with the um, situation down in Dallas with JFK, um, it didn't help. It did not help one bit. So, put in the comments down below what you thought of this. Was it an actual portrayal of J. Edgar Hoover? What it, was it wrong? You let me know because that's, I'm here to give you what you guys deserve. So, that being said, I hope I'm going to let this run. I'm going to see how long. You got about it. But yeah, J. Edgar Hoover, it's been an interesting, it's an interesting one, to say the least. It's an interesting, interesting one, to say the least. I do not know yet which one I'm going to do next week, but there will be another documentary probably. I haven't decided. It will, it might be. Uh, something on along these lines, and as you can tell, this is the people's profile. I want to thank them for making this. If you want to go over and subscribe, the link's in the description. So, I hope you guys have a wonderful evening. I will see you tomorrow for, I don't know what's going on yet, but I'll have something. I actually have the at least a daily show. So until then, have a great evening. And remember, be good to one another because we are in this together, no matter if you're left, right, or center. See you guys tomorrow.